Hi, everyone. I am David Rowland, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Miami Jewish Film Festival's virtual speaker series event. We're thrilled to have director and producer Predrag Peter Antonovich and executive producer Michael Berenbaum with us today. We'll be talking about their new film, Dara of Yosinovich, excuse me if I mispronounced it, which is Serbia's official Oscar entry for best international feature film. Thank you so much for being here today. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us, yeah. And so let's start from the beginning. What first inspired you to make this movie? If I may start, uh, basically, uh, concentration camps, uh, Yasinovac, it's a chain of camps. Um, and Michael will speak more about that because Michael is a historian and very familiar with uh, uh, that subject matter. Uh, is something which is very little known to the uh, uh, wide audience and wide public. And there was no single movie feature ever made on this subject matter. It was a concentration camp uh, in uh, Croatia during the Second World War. And it was uh, run by the Croats. In other words, it was the only camp actually run by non-Germans. And uh, we kind of felt uh, that we should tell that story. And Michael and I spoke about that, you know, a few years back, uh, because uh, it's long overdue to tell the story 75 years since that camp was actually liberated. And uh, that was the reason to go uh, and make this story. And I would like Michael maybe to kind of give some historic background to this concentration. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk one word about the film, which is that uh, Gaga, uh, I call him Gaga because uh, uh, Peter sounds strange and Antonovich sounds strange. So, and his nickname is Gaga. Um, Gaga took a very unique approach to this, which is he told the story through the eyes of a young girl. Now, let me talk for a moment on history. Yasinovich was the only death camp established by non-Germans, run by non-Germans, which took care of the murder of the Serbian, uh, of Serbs, Jews, and Roman Sinti, who are known pejoratively as gypsies. And they were influenced by the atmosphere that was created by the Germans, but the Ustasha regime decided to take things into their own hand and create their own camp. And this is a very unknown camp precisely because it doesn't fit in to the matrix of uh, the normal concentration death camp uh, history that we know. And this gives us a fabulous opportunity to enter the camp and to see the events unfold through the eyes of one young child. And, and what, what sort of research needed to be done to make this historically accurate as possible? If I may well, say, because, yeah, Michael, first, please do. I think the, his, the historical research is you needed to, first of all, you needed to know a little bit of the history. And you needed to be able to explain the history by shaping a narrative. And my job in all of this is to make sure that it's historically faithful and I had known about Yasinovich. I had edited a book on Yasinovich and worked with um, uh, a distinguished uh, Serbian uh, historian on Yasinovich. But the question in Gaga's case was shaping a script that could do the job and then finding the physicality of locations that allow you to present this, present the camp in a visually compelling way that has a feel of authenticity and a sense of integrity. And you can tell us, I got a little bit about what you did to find such a place. Uh, the, obviously, after the, at the end of the uh, Second World War, uh, the whole uh, camp was basically destroyed by the Sustashi, you know, regime. And later, unfortunately, people came to the camp and took some, you know, bricks and uh, stone, you know, to rebuild the houses elsewhere, which means there is no, per se, uh, physical 
evidence of the buildings of the camp, you know. But, uh, you know, obviously we had the photos, we had everything, there was some even, you know, footage, you know, done in the camps and we were able to reconstruct the whole uh, layout of the camp uh, because there was a, like a brick factory and there was a rail tracks, you know, people were brought in, you know, by, by trains and there were obviously barracks and uh, that was just one uh, segment. It's a chain of concentration camps, but then uh, what was unique for this whole uh, 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 tragic, you know, story is that uh, past this camp for uh, adults, there were also, uh, there was a camp also exclusively for children, which was kind of a, uh, nowhere else at the time, you know, and our story takes place in that Yasenovac proper, but also in the camp, which was for the uh, kids only and there were like a number of the things we uh, kind of uh, did following the uh, you know certain events which were like proven, proven documented even in the some court trials after the second world war but also by the historians as well and uh, the whole problem from a, a, a let's say dramatic narrative of the movie was uh, it's composite truth you know but not necessarily this girl uh, uh, saw all of those things, you know, or witnessed all of those things, but they're all, let's say, uh, truthful to what actually happened and transpired uh, during that time. And uh, it was very hard to incorporate all these horrors and to make them uh, kind of a, a narrative which will flow and fulfill all uh, dramatic. I'm talking as a director now, as a uh, somebody who has to tell the story, but I think we succeeded in that, uh, uh, you know, way. And uh, uh, it's very uh, difficult to find a good point of view for all those horrors. But finding this, uh, which was Michael's idea originally to tell it uh, from the point of view of the kid, you know, uh, uh, putting her in a like, let's say as a witness and sometimes she participates, sometimes she witnesses certain things, but the, uh, everything uh, uh, kind of reflected upon her and she uh, came of age in a very short period of time under most horrible uh, circumstances. And that's why we had that, uh, mm -hmm. let's say dramatic uh, uh, a line, which allow us to make the whole, uh, the whole story uh, more compelling. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, it's a very unique situation when you have a, a, a young kid who is uh, ripped off of uh, her childhood and uh, normal kind of a growing up circumstances and thrown into these horrors. And then she has to uh, uh, become a person who not only will try to survive herself, but to protect her brother and try to do some, you know, good things. Let me let me add to that a couple of things. Uh, Gaga's um, likes to say that this is a child who came of age. One of the things we have to focus on is these are children who lost their childhood, and that is they saw things that no child they saw things that no one should see, but they saw things that no child should see. And they saw things as children which they could not process. And some of the most graphic scenes in the movie don't show the graphic nature of the destruction, but show the power of a child looking on and seeing things that shatter, that destroy, that um, make her quiver and make her thoroughly and completely untrusting of the world. Because part of what we want ch childhood to be about is to trust the world and to presume that adults are there to protect you. Some of the most gripping scenes are when we have Roman Catholic nuns, who instead of becoming instrumentalities of safety and compassion and love, uh, become instrumentalities of um, what uh, propaganda, education, destruction, and uh, death. The other thing that, that we were able to do, 
and this Gaga gets full credit for, is in making any movie of this type of destructiveness, you have to make it graphic. But if you make it too graphic, the audience withdraws, they go into a shell. If you, make, if you don't make it graphic enough, you're not telling the truth. And what this film does, and if you look at it in a sophisticated way, what it does is to present the graphicness and then be able to withdraw from seeing the graphicness into the eyes of a child and into the experience of a child, which means that you're experiencing it on two sides, what's happening and the impact of what's happening on a child. And that makes it, um, it let, makes the audience imagine in their mind's eye the evil that has been suggested. Uh, if I can give a, a, a peculiar example, um, there's a difference between a, an erotic movie and a pornographic movie. An erotic movie suggests what's about to happen and lets the audience's imagination fill it in. Gaga both presents it, but then also allows the audience to feel it by seeing it through the eyes of this child. And she was a remarkable actress because she wasn't an actress. And, and so Gaga is working with children um, in such in the heaviest scenarios that child throughout history has ever faced. How, how do you work that balance in working with a child actor to get the performance you need, but also to perhaps protect them from, from the reality? Uh, the, uh, uh, obviously, difficult story, uh, heavy, horrifying scenes for anybody to watch, let alone to act in and to participate in, and especially for the kids. And we knew what we were facing at the time. We kind of uh, in advance uh, prepped the, you know, uh, psychologist, you know, brought to the, you know, occasion, you know, then these kids we selected, we brought their teachers, we brought their families, and we kind of uh, surrounded them with the, uh, uh, you know, friendly and uh, family environment in order to kind of uh, ease the whole uh, situation where they're doing what they were doing on the set. We also had like some kind of a special room for them that they can relax and they can kind of uh, be with their family during the breaks, etc. Cetera, et cetera. However, the kids we picked were kids who never attended any acting classes or any acting school. They were all for, from the villages, you know, and uh, they were different kind of kids. They were not kids with the cell phones. They were not kids playing the games. They would sit down, they would talk. They kind of uh, all had the animals at home. They all had a village-like life. And they were more like uh, uh, down-to-the-earth kids. And uh, very quickly, as we started the whole process, all of a sudden, all these things we kind of uh, prepped in advance to make sure that they are safe, that we will take care of them, were not necessarily needed anymore. Because they kind of uh, felt, OK, I'm here. I have to do this, this is how it happened, and I'm part of this, and I'm very proud. And they really were uh, uh, great, 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 you know. And uh, uh, clearly, it was very difficult uh, from a production standpoint. We were not uh, allowed, in a way, to be late on the movie, because kids kept growing up as we shot the movie. Because during the uh, course of three months, we had a 58 shooting days during the course of three months. We uh, basically had to uh, expand their, uh, uh, you know, costumes twice, you know, because they uh, just uh, they were at the edge when they kind of uh, grow big time. And then, of course, uh, one of the things was at the beginning, uh, you know, they are facing all this food catering, and they came from not to do so great families, to be very honest. And now all no, of a sudden one, they start wonderful, one, wonderful families, but there not prosperous families. Yes, yes. And they were all of a sudden, okay, we should eat this and that. And I'm thinking, shall I tell them, don't eat 10 bananas, you know, or you should <laughs> eat one or two or whatever. But anyway, I'm just saying it's kind of a little bizarre, but it was the, the reality of the whole process. And at the end, we were very, very happy and say successfully merged with the professional actors. I mean, 
you know, you kind of got the documentary feel throughout the movie, you know, all together. The other thing that uh, Gaga, uh, let me tell two stories about it. Uh, the first is that um, we had a young infant, um, a, a kid under two years of age, and Gaga uh, chose to work. Uh, when you work with that, uh, an infant, that's difficult. So Gaga chose to work with uh, someone who was one of the triplets. But um, gradually he discovered something interesting, and uh, you should really tell right. it, that yeah. they have different personalities. Yeah. What, yeah, what basically was interesting, you know, I had experience working with, a, let's say, little kid before, and we kind of had the twins in that movie I shot back in the day called Savior. And uh, we were figuring out, okay, let's find the twins. But we found triplets and we were hoping, okay, one is asleep, the other one will act and the third one is getting ready to act and so forth. However, they were so different as a characters, as a human beings, that it was actually impossible to kind of uh, use them uh, as one. And we opted for this one who is in the movie and we shot the entire movie with that kid. But that was for me amazing as a human beings, we are the same. But at the same time, when you see the particular characters, you know, this was shocking how different they were at the age of year and a half. And uh, that little kid was uh, probably the biggest challenge of our movie because at some point when we narrowed down the choices, what we can shoot towards the end of the movie, last third of the movie, we were kind of a ducking a kid a little bit and saying, okay, we'll do that next day or we'll do it next, next week because we knew the trouble trouble was kind of brewing with the kid. And then at the end, you shoot, you, we shot most of the scenes and now there are scenes with the kid only. And then there are 150 of us plus extras waiting for a kid to wake up or waiting for a kid for three hours to stop crying or how shall we do this, how shall we do that? And he was the one actually controlling uh, the set, but he's such a beautiful, wonderful kid at the end of the day. So the rest, you know. He was directing the director. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Everybody for that material. And and Gaga, looking at your filmography, there's there's a lot of. Uh, you, I, I noticed you've directed many action movies, and there's action in this movie as well. Do you have to, when you're making something more profound than escape than escapism, is there a different way to shoot an action scene? Do you have to? have different rules as, as far as yeah. going going back to uh, what Michael said because you know. I kind of had as a director, uh, uh, let's say interesting, you know, road. You know, I started with the comedy, you know, my first movie, which was a Venice Film Festival was actually satirical comedy, you know. And all of a sudden I'm ending up now with a, you know, very, very, you know, strong and very emotional and, uh, uh, you know, complex movie. But uh, in terms of action, I, had a, uh, I had a you know, few movies in Hollywood which had some action, but also I did some action in like a movie called Savior, you know, which was uh, about the uh, recent, you know, a couple of decades ago, Yugoslavian civil war. And uh, I used some experience from that movie uh, in uh, this picture, because in American action movies, you have like a lot of sometimes bloodletting, you know, they shoot the guy five times and still somehow he comes back and keeps, you know, running after the, you know, good guy. And, but there are no consequences. There are no consequences because uh, they kind of don't die. And uh, there is a lot of bloodletting and there is a lot of explosions and a lot of, you know, bullets flying, but there are no consequences in a way. But in doing the, action in terms of uh, these movies which are depicting the reality and which are dealing with the emotions and which are dealing with the uh, uh, real death, uh, the death looks different in a way in real life. And uh, uh, action becomes more like what Michael said in the eye of the actress. You have to be not too close to look at the, you know, um, uh, uh, blood exploding, you know, from from the from the body of the actor. You can't be too far because you won't be emotionally engaged. It's kind of right in the middle of where you should be. 
too close to see everything, but too far away that you can help. You become a witness. And that's what the, 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 the recipe was. And uh, uh, that makes the things look real, you know, because you can't uh, uh, make it too graphic. You can't overblow the whole, uh, 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 you know, thing of people dying and this and that. But at the same time, if you are uh, uh, kind of a close to be witness, but you just can't reach out there to help, that puts you in emotionally uh, 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 demanding position. And that's the, 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 the thing we try to do. And that's how measure the level of violence, because that was difficult for what Michael said, how you uh, depict uh, such a horrors. If you don't show them, you don't do service to the uh, history and to the truth. If you overdo it, you lose your audience. You, therefore, you don't tell the story or you don't uh, uh, send the message. And I think we found this way that it still uh, stays extremely engaging and disturbing, but at the same time, uh, uh, people don't leave. They don't, you don't lose them. There's another technique that um, was inherent in the script and inherent in the story. It's what we historians call the gray zone. And the gray zone is that um, bad people occasionally do good things. And good people occasionally do bad things. And we don't have the equivalent of in a Western where you have the white hat and the dark um, and the black hat, the, uh, the good guy and the bad guy. Uh, what makes it and what keeps you on edge in the film is to see the moment at which the evil person does something important, significant, human, humane, and good and the point at which um, the victims uh, are, are compromised in an incredible way so that they can't be innocently good. They have to deal with the struggle for survival even while trying something. The other thing that, that was done in the film, um, which is unique in my experience of seeing films uh, being made, was that uh, he shot it from beginning to end. In other words, uh, even if you had to move locations, he shot the script in order. And that was quite, uh, quite remarkable. He also was blessed with um, uh, good weather, 58 days of shooting from um, in the entire fall. And the snow only came on the 59th day after shooting had broken up. And therefore, uh, sometimes you're good, sometimes you're lucky, and you're very often much better off if you're lucky, especially with regard to weather. Was there a, was there a reason why you shot it from beginning to end? Yes, because of the kids. I knew they would keep growing up. And, uh, you know, simply if I kind of shot the things, you know, uh, not in the order, audience might be able to see the difference because we actually said uh, at the beginning, uh, young girl Dara is carrying her little brother Budo. At the end of the movie, Budo is carrying Dara because Budo grew up like big time. And that's why we knew we had to shoot in the order, but not only for that reason, for the reason that for the kids, it was very difficult. They're not professional actors. You kind of had to ease them into the whole situation and they kind of uh, naturally follow okay I'm doing now this and then it's happening that and this and that and that helped a lot because they were able then to kind of follow the whole story. And now that the movie is a question for both of you now that the movie is out in the world what are your hopes that audiences will get from this movie? What are your, what are your uh... well if I may say uh, we uh, are obligated as a human beings, especially us as an artist and filmmakers, to keep reminding the audience that uh, any kind of discrimination of human beings based on the race, religion, or gender uh, is possible again and again. And we want to think about ourselves that we kind of learn from the history, you know, that we will never repeat the mistakes and the horrors we committed as a human beings because the human beings who were killing human beings it was not some monsters uh, we have to 
keep reminding the people, especially about Holocaust, about the uh, one of the, if not the most horrifying moment in the history of humankind, that that doesn't take place again, because we witnessed also that even in the United States, you know, last year, we kind of had this a situation and we see all the time that still even in such advanced societies in the United States uh, things like uh, you know segregation you know discrimination are possible and that's just something which can ultimately if not being checked and controlled can lead to something more horrifying that's why I think uh, we have to keep, have to keep doing what we are doing And I hope the audience takes away an understanding of what this experience was like, a horror at that experience, and consequently a commitment to affirm the values that negate that experience. And after audiences watch this movie and, and are interested in learning more about the, about the subject, do you have any recommendations, movies, books that you uh, could point people towards after they watch this movie if they want to learn more? Michael can probably say something about that. I'm still looking for the one, what I would call a public history of Yasinovich. And that is that a history that, um, and we have this with regard to the Holocaust, a history that is accessible to the non-technical reader and a history that is not trying to score points in the present uh, by reading uh, the past into the present, what tells what happened. There is some material, lots of it. Uh, remember this, this has been an ongoing battle in the region. And part of the um, importance of this film as well is it shows that uh, there were good, uh, there were good, um, people who fought the Ustasha regime, uh, even while it overtook their country. And that should be a careful reminder for us as well today. And do you think there's a reason why Yasonovic isn't as well known as some of the other uh, concentration camps or? Uh... Sure, uh, the, the, reason, the, reason, the reason is several fold. Number one, the Holocaust is widely known because it occurred between, um, it occurred in 22 countries and with one of the most advanced culture in the world, cultures in the world, and also with uh, two groups that remember the past in intricate detail, the Germans and the Jews. Secondly, it fits into a pattern because it has a coherence and inner coherence all its own. And thirdly, Germany was completely defeated and they decided not to um, relitigate the past that they were defeated, but to rebuild, um, rebuild in a very different way as the anti-Nazi, as the anti-fascist and rebuild in a democracy that is pluralistic and tolerant, that's accepting of Jews, etc. This is a region where the ethnic tensions flared up not only in the 1930s and 40s, but also flared up in the 1980s and 90s and came to a very difficult piece. And my experience in the region is a very interesting one. I'll put it to you in a simple um, way. Um, the Dayton Accords that were fashioned by, um, by Richard Holbrook uh, were such that everybody felt that they lost but everybody felt the other guy lost more. Now that's very different than having a winner and a loser. Everybody felt they lost and what made it palatable, and this may have been the brilliance of the accord that ended the conflict, is that um, everybody felt the other guy lost more. And the other part of the conflict is the conflict did not end. It's just that everybody recognized how awful the consequences were for continuing it and nobody wants to start it again. But the ethnic tensions are still there. And it took, uh, Yugoslavia was a, a country of a tremendous mixture of people controlled by uh, Tito and his apparatus. 
which fell apart essentially after he died. And consequently, um, then it blew apart. And it blew apart separately, but it still has not come together. The tension is there, it will continue. Remember World War I was also started in this region and um, everybody's cautious about this. And finally, I'll ask you guys, is there anything we didn't discuss that you would like to bring up about the movie? I think we are good. I think we're good as long as you feel we're good, David. All right, well, thank you very much for the time. You're welcome. Thank you, man. Thank you, appreciate, appreciate, thank you. Bye-bye.